Good morning. Welcome to Crossroads. Good to see you this morning. Uh, we have a number of ladies who are doing a retreat this weekend, and so we're going to pray for them in here in just a second, uh, that the Lord would really bless that time. And uh, we're excited because we believe that God has a plan for us today, right? We're here. We're going to spend time in worship. We're going to spend time in His Word. Uh, this afternoon, for those of you who are participating, uh, we'll have the Radical Study. We're Chapter 3 at 4.30. Uh, we'll also do it tomorrow at 2. It's not too late to jump in. You can go back and you can read the other chapters. Jump in with us. Uh, we're having a really good time with that study. So if you would, stand with me. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless this time. And then we're going to sing some songs and then spend some time in the Word. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that's here this morning. We thank you for the fact that we get a chance to be together and spend some time uh, being able to sing songs to you, about you, uh, to be able to worship you through our giving, through our time in the Word. Lord, I pray that you bless each person, whatever it is that they may be dealing with, that you would give them the wisdom that they need, that you would bring a peace that passes understanding, that you would remind them how much you love them and that your, that your plans are good for them. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In your name, amen.
Good morning, church. Good to be back with you. Um, this past weekend, I went up to Pensacola to visit my brother. He goes to the University of West Florida up there. Um, he's a long snapper for their football team. And I just had a moment um, up there in the stands. I'm not a football girl, I'll tell you that right now. Um, I had more fun just screaming at him, trying to embarrass him a little bit. Um, that was the best part for me. Uh, but he did real good. It was homecoming, and they won, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but what I had a moment up there in the stands. It was, it was really cool. I went to a Christian university. Um, he also did for his first three years. He just transferred um, to West Florida, so he, this is his first year there. And when they all came running out of the tunnel, he was kind of one of the first guys, um, and he ran across the field and went and took a knee on um, – in the end zone, that's it, right? Yes, that's yeah, the ter okay. proper terminology. <laughs> uh, Rand took a knee in the end zone with maybe another guy who was up front. Um, and I was like, oh, that's great, love that. Um, and then like half the team st went over there and started doing that. And coming from a Christian university, I would expect that there, you know. Um, but that, that is not a Christian university at all. Um, it's a D2. I don't really know what that means, but my brother knows what that means, so I just repeat it. Um, it's a college football sport level, I guess. Um, and it was just really cool to see that like half the team was like coming down and just like giving the game to the Lord right right away. And I was just surprised because we weren't necessarily in a Christian environment. And I was like, wow, look at all of these college age men who are just giving their hearts to the Lord and just giving this game to him and putting it in their hands. And I was just so encouraged by that, that I, because I feel like I put myself in a lot of Christian environments. So I'm very used to, used to that. I expect that in the environments that I'm in. So when I'm not in the, in those Christian environments, I don't really expect to see the Lord being praised in very big, obvious ways. And so it was just a really cool moment, and I, I just felt very encouraged um, by that, that the, the next generation is growing in the church, and the Lord is being praised. And it was just really cool, and I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, so we're going to sing the next song, um, the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and I just felt like I saw that this past weekend, that the Lord is faithful in growing the church, and that we are growing as a community it was just incredible to see. So let's continue to just praise his name today.
bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, we love you, and may we always turn to you first, God, in our any situation when we need your strength and when we feel like we don't, Lord. May we just always rely on you and just trust that you know the way and that your way is best, better than our own. I pray that you continue to move in this room this morning, and may we hear from your word and it pierce us to our hearts, Lord. Walk beside you all day, every day. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You know, God has a couple of rules with His economy that are different, really, if you if you think about it from a logical perspective. One, one you you may know this, but God has plenty of money right he's got plenty of resources you know the cattle on a thousand hill belong belong to him every everything is his really yet yet he makes a statement that's different he says he says to us you give and then it'll be given unto you 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 go first a god who, who has no need for anything whatsoever is ask asking us to go first why 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 would it not be that he gives 
and all of a sudden we have this amount of abundance and then we give back. Why, why is it that, that we're supposed to go first? first? And I, I think there's an answer to that. And the answer is because he's Lord and we're not. It's just him simply saying to us, you, just follow my lead. You, you give, then I'll give. But I see so many people who, who, unless they have abundance, unless they have an overflow, their giving is very scarce. They're very scared to give. They, they don't want to go first. They want God to go first. They want God to just flow. And I see a lot of churches like that. God, you give us 150, 200 people in attendance, then we'll, then we'll help other people. You give us 300 people, then we'll help somebody else, right? You, you give us something, then we'll give. Now you say, Pastor, no, no, no one talks like that. Yeah, they do. I've heard it. Then the other thing he says that's, a, that's amazing to me, he says, whatever measure you use in your giving, in your generosity, that's the measure I'll use back to you. Whoa. Not only is he saying, listen, I want you to go first, but he's saying, however you give, that's how I want to give back to you. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty powerful principle of giving. By the way, I don't understand either one of those rules, but I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. He's in charge. If he says give first, then I'll give first. If he says that the, the measure I use is the measure he'll use, then I'd trust that that's the case. And so you know what I want to be? And this is what I hope that your heart is the same way. I just want to be generous. Whether it's time, whether it's talent, whether it's treasure, I want to be generous so that I'm giving to God, expecting that God will give back to me so that I can give back to Him, right? It's not so that I just have some sort of prosperity. It's so that I can give back and invest in the kingdom and be a part of what's going on. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the fact that we have these kingdom principles about giving. It's amazing to think about these ideas that you want us to go first, even though you have everything that the measure we use is the measure that you'll use. God, we, we can acknowledge the fact that you're Lord of everything. Help us to have a generous heart. Help us like the song that we just sang, to, to have vision to see things the way that you see things, uh, to not be overwhelmed by our life and the things that are in front of us, God, but to rather to have faith and to believe that you can do all things. And we give you the praise for it in your name. Amen. So Victoria had an exciting uh, football moment. I, I was a little scared when she asked if that was called the end zone. That made me a little bit, a little bit nervous. But uh, he, she, she was proving that she really wasn't a football person. And she's asking about the end zone. Um, but I had a football moment myself. I got together to, to do the uh, chaplaincy. I've been the chaplain for a number of teams for about 11 years. And one of the teams that I'm the chaplain for is the Keswick Varsity football team. And so uh, I walked in, and a couple of the biggest players on the team greeted me. Um, as I was coming into the locker room. The locker room's kind of a, an interesting place. And so as they came out, they said, uh, they said, Pastor Drew, we got to ask you a question. I said, what, what's the question? They said, are you going to come see the, the musical? I said, well, I'm very uncomfortable with two offensive linemen talking to me about a musical. Um, they said, we're, we, we really hope that we're going to be in the musical. I said, I said, well, 
I, 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 yes, it, 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 there you, I know we're speaking your language now, Victoria. So um, they said, would you pray that we get such and such a part in the musical My Fair Lady? And I said, well, um, I, I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure I really want to be involved in praying for two offensive linemen to get the part uh, in My Fair Lady. I said, but I, I know you're excited about it, right? So then I go in to speak, and it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And as I'm, as I'm doing the message... All the men are putting on pink socks while, I, while I'm preaching. So I, I said, listen, this is a weird moment for me, right? You know, I, I've been talking about my fair lady, and now everybody's putting on pink socks while, while I'm preaching. If you guys don't mind, just giving me 50 push-ups just to bring the manhood thing back up just, to, just a little bit. I said, this is just getting out of control. So uh, we do have some special moments. By the way, the Lord is doing some incredible things uh, in sports. Um, I can give you three of the, of the most successful quarterbacks in a long time are blatantly Christians. Brock Purdy from the San Francisco 49ers, Jalen Hurts, and an and a on fire for the Lord, sharing his faith with everybody is a quarterback that's brand new, setting all kinds of records, C.J. Stroud. All these guys are blatant in their faith. Uh, there are others who call themselves Christians, um, and... Um, they're not exactly, they don't necessarily behave the way that, uh, like a Tim Tebow behaves. They call themselves Christians, they have all that, but I'm like, okay, you got to quit cussing and doing all that kind of stuff to really show uh, your faith. But it is neat to see how God's working and how God's moving. And I know that everybody in here who has a sports team, I'm sure you believe your quarterback is also a Christian. <laughs> in some way or shape or form, right? Acts chapter 11. Peter has received a vision in chapter 10, and you guys can go back and check out that message on Facebook. The Lord has shown him that the gospel's now to go to even Gentiles, right? And so he goes with Cornelius to his home. He preaches the gospel to these Gentiles. They come to know faith. Something incredible happens at that point, and there is a movement that is taking place. Now watch this. It's Peter. Peter is one of the pillars of the church. Um, he is a major, major leader. God has spoken to him through an angel, through a vision. Uh, he is now gone, and he has preached the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think that even though Peter has some clout in the church, and even though God has spoken to him through an angel and through the Holy Spirit, that people may not still have some questions? Do you think they might have some questions along the way? Have you ever had God do a great movement in your life, and people sometimes had a few questions about what was happening? Maybe even a little bit of criticism along the way. In fact, the word is used in this passage, critical. They were critical. So here, watch this. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. We're talking about being built to last. It's the title of today's message. How do, we, how do we lay a foundation for ministry where ministry can last and make an impact for years to come? The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of, an uncir of uncircumcised men and ate with them? So they, they, they want to understand, here they are Jewish people, you don't do that. And Peter did do that, and as soon as he shows up, even though they had heard that people had come to know Christ, they were critical of what had occurred. Here's the first thing you need to know if we're going to build a, a ministry that's going to last. We need to be sensitive to how the Lord is moving as we try to reach different people groups. We need to be sensitive to how the Lord is moving as we try to reach different people groups. See, the reality of the, is that Paul the Apostle was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That this ministry was now opened up to the Gentiles and, and now all Gentiles could have an opportunity to respond to Christ. There are going to be many times along the way that the Holy Spirit will work in our church and in our lives individually and show us different ways that we can reach people. But sometimes those ways cause discomfort for people. I love to be able to share stories about other churches so that you guys can say, that would never happen here. And I hope that that's the case, that it would never happen here. It's always fun to kind of look and think, oh my goodness, that's an amazing thing. Years ago, I sat down in an Arby's, almost 15 years ago, um, to enjoy a lovely meal. Now, I know some of you don't believe that there is such a thing at Arby's, but I do. And so I, I was having a lovely meal. At the time, I did not know about diabetes, so I was having a Jamocha milkshake. And um, 
it helped me discover diabetes. But anyway, I, I, was, uh, I, I was having a Jamocha milkshake and enjoying my time with one of my closest friends, a, a man named Tito. And Tito started to share with me his heart for ministry, that God had called him to share the gospel with people. I said, well, it sounds like God's called you to be a pastor. He said, I, I am trained to be a pastor. I said, well, then you should be a pastor. I said, what's holding you back? He says, I don't have a building. I said, well, then you should use my building. He said, well, I can't use your building. You are one of the fastest growing churches in town. And if I came in there, that wouldn't work. And I said, no, 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 you most certainly can use our building. Now, by the way, um, that was pretty bold of me. I, Jamocha milkshakes empower me, right? Um, I, I was not the lead pastor, uh, but I was indeed giving out our building, right? So I said, you can use our building. So I got back to the office, found my pastor. I said, Pastor, uh, Tito and I had a Jamocha milkshake. We received a vision from the Lord as we, as we had our shake. And uh, Tito's going to set up a church here on the campus. He said, uh, that sounds outstanding. I said, okay, so we'll give him a room and everything like that. I said, you know what? Tito could also use a little bit of money. And the pastor said, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I've got this number in mind. He said, well, that sounds outstanding. I said, pastor, you're a very good man. I will bring you a very nice Jamoko milkshake. You, 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 have been a, you have been a part of the vision. And so we started this church. Now, what ended up happening was Tito was and is a world-class leader. I mean, unbelievably gifted. This church took off. And all of a sudden, we had 150 people in our Hispanic congregation. 150 people, 60 nations represented in our Hispanic congregation. I shared this with our Wednesday night crowd. So the Lord put it on my heart to take our youth group and move our youth group into the basement and let the Hispanic congregation have the auditorium that our youth room had, which was equipped with all kinds of equipment and lots of seats. Now you're starting to catch on to where the problems may start to occur. When the youth pastor takes the rich kids and throws them in the basement so that the, that, that the, the Hispanic congregation can now take over uh, the facility. So people began to talk about me, my mother and her mother as well. I, you know, I, and uh, they, they had some issues. And so I said to them, I said, I said, guys, people are coming to know Christ. The kids that I have in my youth group, they don't care that they're in the basement. They, they, they don't care at all. They think it's cool that we're packing them in the basement, right? And I said, the God is going to bless our youth members, but we need to watch this and see what's going to happen. Well, they came to me one day. They said, you know what we need to do? We need to celebrate the fact that there are multiple nations being reached. I said, well, how would we celebrate? They said, the way that we would celebrate is that we would have each nation make a meal and put it out under a tent and we would surround the building with 60 different nations preparing a meal. I said, now that is of the Lord for sure. I said, that's what we'll do. I said, in fact, why don't we do this? Every area that has food, someone will put, can put up a flag that represents their nation. So there they were, 60 flags all surrounding the church building. Hundreds of people showing up. You guys can catch on to where this might be going. So a group of men came to me. They said, Pastor Drew, we need to speak to you. I said, you, you do? They said, um, look out there and see what's going on. I said, it is, it's beautiful. They said, we forgot the most important flag. <laughs> now, I, I, listen. I mean, I would just be fooling you if I didn't tell you that I wasn't somewhat a smart aleck. You know, so, so, I, so I, I said, oh, the Christian flag. <laughs> uh, they didn't like that. I, I, I liked it. I, I thought it was quite, quite amusing. And, and I, I said, the Christian flag. And they said, not the Christian flag, the American flag. I said, ah, I said, the most important flag to you and to me, right, as Americans, but not the most important flag to all of our friends here who come from all different nations who also love their own nation. We're going to tell the pastor what you said. I said, please do, and don't misquote me. <laughs> Make sure you tell him about the Christian flag. He's going to love that part. Yeah, I, and, and so the ministry kept growing and expanding and reaching people. Then I did the unthinkable. One day I realized that we had 60, 70 children, 60, 70 children now a part of this ministry. I decided that it made no sense to have a different nursery for the Hispanic kids than it did for the other kids. And so I brought them all together. By the way, the kids were thrilled to be together. 
But not everyone was thrilled. So why in the world do we have to watch the children and do this and that? I said, wait a second. I said, let me ask you a question. If tomorrow 60 white kids showed up at church, would you be happy? Oh, pastor, this is not about race. I'm like, oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Jesus is watching. Be very careful what you say next. I said, if 60 kids that look just like your kids showed up next week, would you rejoice or not rejoice? They said, we would, we would rejoice. I said, then don't talk anymore. Just rejoice. Just rejoice with me. Because we're trying to reach all kinds of people. We're trying to reach all kinds of people groups. We're trying to make a difference and make an impact for the kingdom of God. And so let us, what? Rejoice, right? But people don't always see it the same way. Sometimes they come and they criticize because they don't like the fact that you're reaching too many people that are second chance people. You know what a second chance person is? It's someone who blew up their whole life using drugs and alcohol and had three or four marriages and hurt all kinds of people and were involved in prostitution and dealing drugs and causing all kinds of problems, but they came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now they're tattooed from head to toe and they're sitting in church worshiping Jesus. By the way, good thing. That's a good thing, right? But what ends up happening is they might invite their friends. And their friends are thugs. Here, here you go. Here's your quotable quote for today. Thugs need Jesus too. See, the reality of it is, is that Peter was being criticized for revival breaking out. And I have been criticized for years for reaching different people groups. One of the biggest criticism I received for a little while was the idea of reaching skaters. We opened up a skate park and people were like, this is dangerous. People are going to get hurt. This is a terrible idea. Hundreds of skaters came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Listen, listen, here's the idea. The idea is this, that you and I are sensitive to Christ and we're asking God what it is that he wants us to do. And as he gives us an open door with certain people groups, then we walk through the door and we trust that God is in control, just like Peter did. Peter did something that he knew people weren't going to like, and they criticized him. Now, I love Peter's response, and here's the second thing you know. We must be willing to share with believers who may be concerned how we believe that God is opening doors for ministry. If we see God opening up a door and then people are concerned, people are not happy, right, with what we're thinking, then we have to be willing to sit down and in love talk through what it is that we see God doing. Rather than be all upset with everyone and, and call them names and that sort of thing, we have to take the time to sit down. And so Peter says, hey, I get it. You're, you, you don't understand at all what just happened, but let me tell you a story. And then Peter begins to tell his story. Starting from the very beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Syria, from Syria stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and said, and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. 
So he took the time. We need to be sensitive to how the Lord's going to move and to give us a vision for reaching different people groups. I've seen people reaching fine art students, people reaching athletes. I've seen people reaching uh, different ethnic groups, reaching different neighborhoods. God's working and God's moving. We need to be sensitive to that. We must be willing to share with believers who may be concerned about what's happening. We need to take the time and say, hey, I understand that you don't get this, but this is what we believe God's showing us to do. This is the direction that we're going. We're not criticizing you because you're concerned. We're just saying to you, we understand what your concerns are, but we need to do it anyway. We need to move forward anyway, even if it's something that you don't necessarily feel comfortable with. <coughs> I've had numerous people since I've lived in Pinellas County say things to me that should never be said. Major Christian church leaders about ministries that were taking place that should never have said what they said. And I've had to say to them in, in love and gently say to them, listen, I, I, I believe that I know your heart. I don't really totally know your heart. I believe I know your heart. But what you just said is not okay with God. It's not okay with God. When, when we were talking about reaching a certain people groups, we've had, I've had people come to me and say to me, hey, if you're going to reach uh, this particular people group, well, one lady, she's, <laughs> it's a very sad moment. She said, well, what would the neighbors think? I, I, said, I said, listen, listen to me. You got to listen very carefully. When you're, when you're leading a church and when you're trying to get the gospel to lost people, I don't care what the neighbors think. I, I don't care. I, my, my goal is not to try to get all the lost neighbors to think that we're doing politically correct things. I don't care. What I care is what, would, what does Jesus think, right? Because after all, whose church is it? See, it's right. So, so we're, not, we're not looking around, hey, what would the neighbors think? What does Jesus think? And what Jesus thinks is that he came to this world to seek and save those who are lost. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Broken people and people who seem to have had it all together. People who have plenty of money and those who have nothing. Jesus Christ loves all people and his agenda is to see people come to know him. And that is well, it's my agenda too. And, 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 and whatever, whatever it is that God calls us to and pulls us into or whatever it may be. And I've had people talk to me about all kinds of things that have occurred. At Seminole First Baptist, we built the first truly diverse youth group, half black, half white. There were multiple things said about me. Yet we were baptizing sometimes 30 and 40 kids a year. But people still talked about me. They had, to, oh, you did this and you did that. And you don't care about our people. I'm like, our people? Our people, do you hear yourself? We are people. Not our people and your people. We are just people trying to, to glorify God with our lives and with our ministries. And listen, just so you know, God has given this church some, some reserves and he's given us a beautiful building. And we are going to reach all kinds of people. We are. And sometimes along the way, people may not enjoy it. I love what one friend said. He said, we're trying to build an ABC church at our church. I said, what's an ABC church? We want to reach every age, every background, every color. I said, well, wow, wow. I'll take an ABC church myself. That sounds real good because God cares about what? Every age, doesn't he? cares about people who have all kinds of different backgrounds and he certainly cares about people of every color God cares and so we ask ourselves just like Peter said listen I've never done this before but if Jesus says that to kill and eat then I'm gonna get on his agenda and then the people kind of understood what he was saying now watch this next thing that happens now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia Cyprus and Antioch spreading the word only among Jews. They felt like the gospel was just for Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The, Lord hands, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And so here's what happened. These men here, wait a second, we were traveling to all these cities only talking to Jews. But now we're hearing that Jesus Christ is wanting to share the gospel with everyone, including Gentiles. And so they get up and they take off back to the same city and they start finding Gentiles to preach the gospel to. Now, they also pick a city, Antioch. 
Antioch is their location. It's the spot that they want to do ministry, that they want to make a difference. Here's the thing that you need to know if we're going to build a ministry that's going to last. We need to prayerfully choose specific places for ministry. Whether it's a campus ministry or whether it's a neighborhood, wherever it may be, we need to figure out, God, where is it that you want us to go? What, what do you want us to do that's going to make a difference in the lives of other people? And wherever the Lord's opening up the door, we pick that specific place and we say, God, we are going to do everything in our power. We're going to pray. We're going to use resources. We're going to use our talents to make a difference in this particular neighborhood or at this particular school or in this particular assisted living facility, wherever it is that the Lord starts to put something on our heart and say, this is, this is where I want you to go. This is the spot. There's a, a, a church called Discipleship Church that's led by Pastor Trail Martin, who I will invite to come preach here one day. You'll, you'll love Pastor Trail. Pastor Trail is, is, has got a vision, and his vision involves one high school. He's mobilized his entire church to reach out to a high school called Northeast High School. And, and the whole vision is to help with the sports ministries and to do all kinds of things with first priority and to see God move and God work. They, they, they show up as a church and they handle all of the concession stands for the high school. Uh, there are people who are members of the church walk up and down the line uh, handling the little 10 yard thing. Uh, see, now look at me, I don't know what that is. But anyway, they, they're doing the measuring, right? They're doing their thing. There, there, there's people who are, are involved in all aspects, including Pastor Trell doing the chaplain's talk and spending time with the team. The coach whose who's faith is interesting, an interesting journey that he's on, started to attend their church. He'd not been in church in a long time. Now he's faithfully attending their church. God's working and God's moving. See, the reality of it is, is that we can't do everything. We just can't do everything. But, but we certainly can do something. I love what one pastor said. He said, do, do for the many what you wish you could do for the, uh, do for the one what you wish you could do for the many. See, what ends up happening is that some people say, oh, well, wait a second. We would love to reach this little elementary school, but you know what? I mean, that's not really fair because if we reach the elementary school, we probably should be reaching the middle school as well. No, no, listen, you just ask God, God, where is it that you want to open up a door for ministry? And then we walk into that door. Now, it may be multiple things, but we do it well, right? It's amazing to see how God is moving. I just talked to a man. I'm going to fly out there and see uh, this particular ministry, a Christian businessman. God showed him that one of the best places in the world to reach kids was in the fourth grade. I don't know if you, if you know this, but the, the way the world's gone in middle school, kids are talking about and seeing things and doing things that high school kids used to do, right? So, so, so now it's happening at the middle school level. And so he has this vision for fourth graders. So he went in and, and mobilized churches all through Dallas to, to mentor fourth graders. And then in the conversation, by the way, just so you know, I've done a ton of mentoring here in Pinellas County. The way it works, you're allowed to talk about your faith as long as the conversation gets brought up naturally. Okay? So here's how you bring up the conversation naturally. It's very simple. The very first time I buy five guys, put the burger down in front of my mentee, and I say to them, hey, man, how's your weekend going? What are you going to be doing at 10 o'clock on Sunday? Well, nothing. What are you going to be doing? Oh, funny you ask. I actually go to church. And now the conversation has started, right? And we talk about Jesus for the rest of the time, right? Totally legal. Do you know how many fourth graders are being mentored by Christian people in Dallas, Texas? 4,000. 4,000 fourth graders because of one guy who said, God, where could I use my resources to make a difference? And God spoke to him and said, I want you to reach fourth graders. By the way, does that sound a little specific? It, it, you, think, you think God might get specific with us as individuals and say, this is what I want. I want you to reach this person and go there. Now watch this. They pick the spot to do the ministry. Now this is where it gets a little, little kind of us thinking a second. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now, I don't know that I shared this with you. I think I've shared it with another group. But I have this weird... It's a weird tradition. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be open with you about a weird tradition that I have. So when I, when I fly back home, when I fly back into this area, I always try to listen to two songs. They're both, they're both country songs. Don't, 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 um, 
don't judge. They remind me about something that I want for me and for my life. One, one song is a song called One of the Good Ones. One of the Good Ones. And, and basically, it's a girl singing about how her man is the real deal. That he reads his Bible, that he loves his mom, that he, that he loves her, that he makes her feel important. And, uh, and I listen to that song, and I say, you know what? That's what I want to be. I want, I want to be one of the good ones. I, I want my wife to hear that song and, and look at me. And I, I want, here's what I want. When that song plays, I want my wife to look at me with a smile and be like, I don't want to be like, you hear that? <laughs> Listen to the words. You know, I, no, I don't want that. But another song I listen to. I know, the, I know whoever's my seatmate must think I'm a weirdo. I, I'm flipping and I'm working this thing like I'm a DJ, you know. I, I moved to the other little song called better man better man and this song the girl is, is singing about how she really loves her guy he's just not a good guy he keeps making the same mistakes he keeps drinking he keeps hurting her he keeps causing her and she's like it, it, it could be different if you were a better man it could be different right I think to myself, I say, God, God, and I pray. I'm praying. I'm listening to country music and talking to Jesus. It can be done. I, I, I'm listening, and I'm saying, God, make me one of the good ones, not someone that my family is saying, dear God, I wish he was a better man. Now, you say, well, that's just a little personal. That's your little thing. You got your country songs. By the way, there's, I know that some of you are going to help me out. And you're gonna be like, there's newer songs than those. No, 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 I'm sticking with my two. Um, but let me, let me say this to you. Sometimes I wonder if, if God was to just, just break out revival and give us all kinds of opportunities, who would we send, right? Who, who would we send to, to that school and who would we send to that particular neighborhood? Who are the people in our congregation, men and women? And I believe there are some. I believe there's a lot. But who, who would we send to go and to encourage that ministry who would get the call? See, see, what happened was, is that Barnabas was one of the good ones. He was one of the great leaders in the church. And when revival broke out in Antioch, the church picked him to go and represent. Now, I ask you the question, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, if your number gets called, are, are you ready to step in? If, if all of a sudden God says, hey, I, I want you here, and I, I want to use you for this particular minute, I want to use you here, or are there, are there issues? Because every leader that I look for, I'm looking for only three things in that leader. I'm looking for the person to be a person of character. That they read the word of God and they practice what it says. And that all the people in their life, the people that they work with, their family, everyone that they know thinks of that person as the same thing. That's a, that's a sold out Christian guy. That's a sold out Christian girl. They're a person of character. They're not someone sneaking behind and lying and, and cheating on their spouse and, and, and saying things to other people that's not true or manipulating other people or people who are trying to pull power games or playing around with their money in a way that's not honoring to God. They're a person of character, right? You know what else I'm looking for? Not just a person that has great character. I'm looking for a person that's full of compassion. They literally love hurting people so much that when they see people going through things, they fill it with them. It's not just that they're good people or their character, but they care what other people are going through. They, they have character. They have co compassion. And you know the last one that I look for in a person I can say, hey, I'm going to send you? It's something that's ignored sometimes in the church, and I don't know why. Because what we're doing is the most important work that's ever been done, advancing the kingdom of God. Something that is ignored in the church sometimes is a word called competence. Competence is just to know what it is that you're doing, to get better at what you're doing. For, for some of you in this room, God's walked you through difficulties in your own marriage. You've made it through and you're grateful to God because of the grace that he gave you. But there's going to be other people whose their marriage is hurting 
And you need to take the time to learn how to tell your story and how to, and how to provide some ideas to that person so that you can help someone who needs it. We, I was in a restaurant with my nephew the other day, and um, uh, some, the person happened to be having a seizure. I could tell that they were having a seizure, that they weren't choking. But the um, waitress thought that they were choking. And so it was, a, it was a Longhorn Steakhouse full of people up in Atlanta. She started yelling for someone to come that could help, right? So, so out of all the people that were there, a lot of people got up, but only one knew how to help, right? And, and as he came up to, to, to help, I sat still. I didn't move at all even because I don't really know much about that. And I didn't want to get in the way of someone who did know about that. But I thought to myself, man, what on earth, how in the world would I have felt if that person really was choking and they died two tables over for me because I just didn't know what I was doing, right? That would be a problem. I would, you know, and so I thought, man, I, I, I don't have the competence level to, to help in this situation. Do you, do you understand that there are people whose eternities at stake? And you and I knowing what we're doing and knowing how to handle the word of God without being ashamed and knowing how to tell our story without making it about us but making it about him, us having some level of competence helps us step up to the plate and make a difference. And I'm talking to eighth grade kids these days, right now a group of eighth graders that I'm spending a little time with and I'm talking to them about these three things, character, compassion, competence. You know why I'm talking to eighth graders? Because we need leaders in our church. We need leaders, not at just at Crossroads, but in our church across. We need young people to catch the vision, to be the kind of people God's called them to be, and to step into the next high school and then into college. I love the fact that Barnabas steps in. Look here in verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now let me review this real quick because I'm going to hit my last point here. We need to be sensitive to how the Lord is moving to reach different people groups, however the Lord's opening doors. We, may, we must be willing to share with believers who may be concerned how we believe that God is opening up these doors for ministry. We need to prayerfully choose specific places for ministry. We need to ask God to show us where it is that he wants us to do particular uh, specific ministry. We need to have leaders in place who can oversee ministries as they develop that we can call people's numbers and they can step up people of character, compassion, and competence. We need to establish a solid discipleship and teaching ministry wherever we set up a new ministry. Wherever God opens up the door, teaching needs to take place. Look what happens here. Barnabas goes to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brings him back and they begin to what? They begin to teach them the Word of God. Now, let me say this to you. This is my reflective time of the year. I, the, 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 August to October is ridiculous for me. November to December is a little bit different. It involves sugar-free hot chocolate and Hallmark movies. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a little bit different, the, the pace. But this is where I start to really ask God the most important question for me every single year. God, what is it that you want to do in me and through me so that I am not the same person next Thanksgiving? I do not want to be the same person next year. I want to be closer to God. I want to understand God more. I want to be surrendered to God more. I do not want to be the same person. I've been a Christian since 1977. Oh, God, please help this not be as far as I'm going to grow spiritually. If this, if this is it, just take me now. I, I want to grow more. I want to be more like Christ. I don't want to settle for where I am right now. And so I start to think as Thanksgiving, my family's sitting around the table and we're talking about the things of God and what God's doing in our life. And I'm around family members who aren't saved, whose eternity's hanging in the balance. I'm asking God, please don't let me be the same man next year. Show me what books you want me to read. Show me what missions you want me to go on. Show me what people you want me to meet, what money you want me to give. Just don't make me the same because I want to be who you want me to be. You know how I'm going to grow? I'm going to be involved in discipleship. 
Now, re brace yourself for this. I'm going to attend a small group and have somebody kind of pouring into me. I'm going to have some mentors who are pouring into me. And then I am going to do the most important thing any Christian in this room can do to grow between now Thanksgiving and next Thanksgiving. I am going to disciple myself. That's what I'm going to do. You say, oh, pastor, you're pretty bold. You, you disciple yourself. No, no, no. I am going to sit down and read my Bible and talk to God and ask the Holy Spirit to grow me up. You are responsible to disciple yourself. And we as a church are responsible to provide all kinds of tools, all kinds of tools. Whether it's book studies or whether it's discipleship material or Sunday school, our job is to come alongside and provide tools. But you are to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And you are the only person to blame if next Thanksgiving you're the same person that you are right now. You, not me. Don't call me a pastor. I just, man, I, I'm not getting as much out of those messages. I really wish you could. Okay, listen, are you reading your Bible for yourself? Are you praying and talking to Jesus yourself? Do, do you want to grow as much next year as I do? I do? Because here's the deal. It's, it's important. Now watch this. They didn't just see all these people become Christians. They taught them the word. They discipled them. They poured into them. Saul and Barnabas established a solid discipleship and teaching ministry. Now here's the last one. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and, and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So what ended up happening was they realized that God showed them that there was going to be a need. They took up an offering from this group of people and they sent it to another group of people. We need to look for ways to encourage and bless others in ever-expanding circles. We need to keep asking God, God, what, what is it that you would want us to do that's not just about Crossroads, but it's about our mission partners and, and all these other people that you might bring into our midst. Church, I would say to you off, off beat, off the uh, message, be very careful not to allow all of the political things that are going on to, to shake you off of one thing. Israel belongs to God. And God is not pleased when, when things, when people all through history have come after him pull your map out of the Middle East. Israel's a very small part of the Middle East, but it is at the heart of the story. So as people protest this and protest that, remember this, what a weird time that we're living in 2023 and people are speaking about Jewish people the way that they're speaking. And those of us who are Christians, we have to stand up. It can't be a question of whether or not we believe that God is for Israel. And you say, oh, pastor, what about this and what about that? No, I don't want to see anyone lose their life. I don't want to see people hurt. or I don't want to see any of that. But I do know this. There are evil people in this world whose intention for God's people is bad. And for us as a nation, we need to be very, very careful. We, as Christians, we need to be very careful. Not to get pulled into this kind of political, kind of back and forth, but to pray for the peace of, of Jerusalem, to have a passion and a heart for God's people. You do understand, this is, the, the, I'm not saying that this is the end, but this is how it will end. The whole world will be fighting against Israel, and NATO won't fix it, and America won't fix it, but someone will. And when Jesus shows up, <coughs> he comes to win. <laughs> he comes to win. And when Jesus wins, everyone who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior wins. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. And so, so it, it, we're watching all this happen. I just want you to be very careful as a church and as Christians to, to remember that God loves Israel and that they're a special part of his plan. Always has been, always will be. And uh, so anyway, worship team, come on up. just want to give you my little pro-Israel ending here. Hey, if you would, stand up with me, and uh, I'm going to pray over us.
God, here we are, Crossroads Church, standing before you, individuals who have different networks and different people that we know. What do you want from us, Lord? What, what do you want us to do that would advance your kingdom on earth? What, what do you want us to do that would lift your name up high so that you can draw people to you? God, what, what part do you have for us to play in this big, incredible love story that's being played out? This redemption story that Jesus Christ is bringing mercy and grace to this world. God, help us. Help us to be sensitive to what it is that you want us to do. And help anyone that's in this room that knows that the sin in this world has entangled them. To throw those things off so that they can run the race and when that their number is called, they can step up to be the people that they want to be and that they long to be. God, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us where we've fallen short. Forgive us for any selfish agenda. Forgive us for any inward focus that did not honor you. And God, we pray for your favor to fall on this place and that the city would be blessed because of us. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In your name, amen.
Amen. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Phyllis. Just want to say with uh, pa just to kind of get on what Pastor Drew was saying with the Israel thing that it's so easy for us just to get on the news, whatever news source that we have, and start to feel that anger of of people fighting on one side to the other. I pray every day that this fighting stops, God takes over, his spirit ends this conflict so innocent people do not perish, especially those that do not know Christ right now. We do sponsor missionaries that are in that location in the Middle East, so we pray for those missionaries as they are in the midst of the fighting. Good morning, everybody. I hope it's glad to see, I'm glad to see everybody here in the auditorium. Those on social media, thank you for tuning in. Um, if anybody is interested in joining to be a member of our congregation, um, there's going to be a member orientation that will be held on Sunday, November 5th at 8, 8 a.m. You can sign up with the Connect card that's in the seat back in front of you. If we do have any visitors here for the first time, if you could fill that out and turn it in the lobby, we have uh, a gift for you. Celebration of life services, I didn't get a chance to say this last week, is planned for Arthur uh, Constine on Sunday, November 12th at Fred Howard Park in Tarpon Springs, shelter number five at 3 p.m. Arthur is the husband of Rachel Constine, so keep her in your prayers. We are having a fall festival on Saturday, November 4th, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. We are still looking for volunteers, so, there, so you could sign up for different areas that we're looking for volunteers in the lobby. If you have any questions, uh, you could contact Judy Wells. Anyone can still join us for the Radical Series Bible Study. Uh, by David Platt through uh, Pastor Drew and and we are meeting on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. and on Mondays at 2 p.m. There are books involved so there is a cost for those books at $15. Operation uh, Christmas Child gift boxes are uh, almost time to bless them, and send them on their way out to the children of the world. And we are looking for anybody to donate some money uh, for the postage that's involved in that. And it's about $10 for a box. So if you could give even just for one box, that would be great. Our mission focus is Hope Alive 268, Swatini, Africa. N another one of our missionaries that we support. Fight hunger, human trafficking, and so forth. Okay. If we could bow our heads and go to the throne. Father, may our worship be acceptable before you. Before you. Let the peace that surpasses all understanding be with us as we leave here. Help us to make a difference in the world this week. Let our words and actions align with your word. Help us to practice what we have learned here today. Bless us as we leave this place and help us to be a blessing to everyone that we meet and interact with. Help us never to forget that you're with us always. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody have a great week, and hopefully see you next week. <laughs>